This is Harry S. Truman speaking. This room is an exact reproduction of the presidential office in the west wing of the White House as it was in the early 1950s. The furniture, the rug, the drapes are duplicates of those used in the White House when I was president of the United States. The pictures you see on the wall and the things you see on the desk are those I had in the White House. The globe in front of the mantel was given to me by General Eisenhower at his headquarters in Frankfurt, Germany in 1945. As the duties and responsibilities of the president expanded, more working space was needed in the White House. The executive office wing on the west side was built in 1902 during the administration of President Theodore Roosevelt. It houses the office of the president, his secretaries, and the principal assistants. This wing is connected by a passage with the main White House where the president is found to live and hold state functions. The almost hidden door on the right of the fireplace leads to the office of the president's private secretary. The one on the left leads to the corridor and to the cabinet room. The desk is a copy of one installed by President Theodore Roosevelt when the office was built. The office has been occupied by all the succeeding presidents. In the office of the president, he has centered all the responsibility for the administration of the government of the United States. Since the birth of the American Republic, the office of the president has grown and developed into the most important office of government in the history of the world. I hope that the exhibits in this library will give you, and especially the young people among you, a better understanding of the history and nature of the presidency and the government of the United States. A special occasion for us, certainly. It's always great to, uh, to be bringing new things into the collection, and something like this that has the, the history that it does and the connection to Mr. Truman and his legacy and uh, kind of the way this came about, and that will unfold in some other remarks. But a uh, very, very great day for us to be uh, welcoming this. Uh, this uh, great bronze into our into our collection, and, and uh, so it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the library, uh, where we celebrate all things Truman, and uh, very grateful for that uh, wonderful presidential legacy that we celebrate. Want to uh, introduce some special guests. We have some representation from the Jackson Center. We have some members of the family here. Uh, we have Mr. Dillingham from the board of, uh, of our trustees here, of the uh, of our nonprofit partner, the Library Institute. Uh, Mr. Workman and. Uh, Mr. Benedict are here as well to talk about how this came about. So, so what we're going to do is we want to hear first from uh, Don, who kind of kicked this whole thing off a little bit for us, and then we'd like to hear a few words from Dexter, who's the artist who commissioned the piece, and then I think we'll unveil and play. He's going to give a little bit of a uh, context for us here, and then uh, and maybe we'll get some remarks from the family as well. Does that sound like a, a good order of things? Don, do you want to come and say a few words for us? Thank you. Um, I'm speaking not uh, just for myself, but also on behalf of uh, my family, my wife, Chris, and our daughter, Roberta. Uh, and Chris, unfortunately, couldn't, couldn't make the trip with me. But my relationship uh, to the Truman Library goes back to 1964, when I, I first came here as a uh, uh, high school student to the National FFA Convention, which was held in Kansas City. Uh, for uh, decades and decades, and one of the side trips that uh, that we took was here to the Truman Library. Of course, Mr. President Truman was still alive at that time, but I did not have the, uh, the good fortune to uh, to get to see him. Um, but I was fascinated with the library, and I came back subsequently uh, because. Um, one of the major uh, seed industry meetings, uh, I'm, I'm a seedsman by profession, just retired, but one of our major annual meetings is held uh, at the Crown Center in, in Kansas City. So I've been coming to Kansas City for almost 40 years, and uh, on one of those trips I decided that I really wanted to come back here and, and spend time 
by myself at the Truman Library, which I did before the meeting, before that seed meeting. Eventually, I became uh, president of that association for uh, two years, and during the uh, second year, we, uh, we negotiated uh, with the library to have our officers and directors uh, banquet here in this very space where we're standing. So uh, these are temporary walls, as you can see, and so forth. And they were not here at that point in time, so we had about uh, 50 or so people here in the Truman Library. I, I remember it so well, and I, I can't say for sure that the cars were right there at that point <laughs> in, in 2000 or 2001, but uh, I remember them so well. So again, I, I've had this relationship, personal relationship with the library and have always had such great respect for President Truman. And then <clears throat> through my uh, our family's uh, relationship with Professor Benedict and, and his family. Uh, I sit on the board of trustees of Cooper College, where he where he taught uh, art uh, for uh, several decades, and uh, and uh, he, uh, he and his family eventually joined the same church that we attend, and and so we got to know each other rather well, and so I I, I began to understand what it is that he uh, does as an artist, and. Um, he invited us to, uh, among many other things, this could be an all-day story, but uh, among many other things, uh, to um, a showing of a portrait bust of Justice Robert Jackson, which he had uh, been commissioned to create for the Supreme Court. And, and so we went to his studio and, and we saw it there. And, uh, and then, as Professor Benedict will tell you, I, I get these ideas. And, and uh, it occurred to me, with the, with the uh, 70th anniversary of the end of the war and the beginning of the Nuremberg trial and, and what have you, that uh, I wonder if or what they have at the Truman Library that represents the relationship between Justice Jackson and President Truman, and of course, uh, uh, did a little little reading, a little research about the fact that uh, President Truman, uh, it was President Roosevelt who appointed Jackson to the Supreme Court, but then it was President Truman who asked him to uh, be the chief prosecutor for the United States at the Nuremberg trials, and then as uh, Mr. Peterson here, particularly, and, and and Tom Schmidt from the Jackson Center. And tell, tell you, it was Justice Jackson who, who had to take hold of that entire process and, and organize it. And that culminated in what I think was called the London meeting. Uh, am I right? Uh, London agreement. Yeah. The London meeting where they brought together these, these jurists from, uh, from the, all of the allies uh, to determine how they were going to conduct these trials. And, and Jackson was so intent that, that this needed to serve as a model, uh, they needed to do it right, and they needed, because uh, the Russians, for instance, just wanted to take all of the German war criminals and shoot them. That was their, let's just, just get re execute them. But uh, Jackson and others said, no, we're not going to do that, we're going to have a legitimate trial, we're going to prove their guilt, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and then he had to organize how all, because this had never been done before in the history history of civilization. It had never been done that those who had perpetrated these horrible war crimes were going to be brought to justice in a, uh, in a very uh, orderly and uh, appropriate manner. So he did all that. And then uh, it, it's uh, further stated that uh, his opening remarks uh, at the trial, and then his closing remarks at the trial are, are some of the greatest uh, uh, legal oratory uh, of all time. So I, you know, I became very interested in all this, and um, I got this idea. I wonder what they had at the Truman Library, and I had read about this exhibit. In fact, I have a copy of the uh, announcement in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, about this exhibit, and I got this idea, well, I wonder what they have. So I called here, 
And the first person I ended up speaking to was Mr. Pauski. Uh, this gentleman, who's the current director, was not even yet on staff here at the time. So I talked to Mr. Pauski and I said, uh, uh, are you interested in Robert Jackson? And do you, what do you have? And you know, what, what could we do? And then I told him about Professor Benedict and about, and to bring the story to today, uh, Within a few weeks, really, um, uh, Mr. Bosky came back to me and said, uh, we'd like to proceed. We'd like to have what you're proposing that we have. So I uh, immediately notified Professor Benedict and said, uh, let's, let's get pouring that bronze. <laughs> and uh, of course, there's a heck of a lot more to it than just that. But uh, that's why we're here today. That's why we're here today, and as you can see uh, from the rest of the exhibit and, and what's happening here, is that I think it's very appropriate that we're here today. And, and I'm so thrilled. Uh, my wife and I made a, a trip to the uh, Jackson Center in Jamestown this summer to, to tell them uh, what we were doing, and, and I'm so pleased that, that uh, Tom, you, and, and Greg are here. And then, and then we said, and is there anyone from the Jackson family who might be willing to uh, participate? And so here's Julia Craighead, who is Justice Jackson's granddaughter. And, and so we're so thrilled that, that you're here as well. So that's, that's how we got to be here. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, um, just, just in case you missed it, because there was a, there was a little uh, a little modesty there, you can quite come out. He he funded this uh, this this bus, and so the reason that, that we're here and the reason we're getting this is because he and his family have graciously and generously paid to have this done, and so we, we greatly appreciate that. I'm just wondering, Clay, in the order of things, maybe do you want to talk for just a moment now about the about the context here that it's set in, and then and then maybe we'll unveil and allow Mr. Benedict to talk a little bit about his work. Okay, sounds fine. Uh, this opportunity came along at a perfect time for us because the theme of our exhibit uh, for this year is um, the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, and it's also the 70th anniversary of the beginning of the Truman administration. And we, our exhibit basically came up to the end of the war, but when um, Don Workman approached us with this idea. We got to thinking, well, you know, we could do a coda to the exhibit. We could, we could add another section that's sort of a, a final what happened then type thing. And, and the Nuremberg Trials made a perfect subject for that. And of course, uh, Justice Jackson was, as you said, the prime mover of how those trials were organized and so forth. And so to have a uh, bust of uh, uh, Robert Jackson as a centerpiece. So this little section worked quite well. We did go in and we pulled out some things from our own collection relating to the Nuremberg Trials. We have uh, a letter um, from Justice Jackson to President Truman, uh, kind of early on, telling how progress was going. It's a really interesting thing to read. Um, we also have some materials from Catherine Fight, who was uh, Justice Jackson's assistant. Uh, we have a nice collection in our archives uh, uh, relating to uh, Catherine White's papers. We've included some of those here as well. We also, and I turned it off so we could hear right now, but as soon as the presentation's over, I'll turn this video monitor on again. Um, President Truman did a series called the Decision Series on television in, the, uh, in 1964. And one of those ep episodes was devoted to the Nuremberg Trials. And so we excerpted clips from that episode of the Decision Series and have about a four-minute uh, video clip here in which Truman explains why the trials, why he wanted the trials to take place, sort of reiterating what you said. It's the alternative is just line everybody up and shoot them. Um, and then Justice Jackson also talks about, um, you know, why the trials are taking place and what the what we plan to do uh, proceeding. So we we'll see, see that on the video. Uh, and then we have some graphics uh, that we put in here as well. But it's a nice little coda to our till we meet again exhibit. So the timing worked out beautifully. And, and 
as I was explaining to some of the representatives from the Jackson Center earlier, we're in the process of undergoing a major master plan, which will include a capital campaign and a redo of our, our principal uh, exhibits, our, our permanent exhibits. And this will allow us to tell this story in a way that we have not been able to do before, because as Clay mentions, the actual physical collection, our three-dimensional collection, will be, uh, will be enhanced in that way. So we're very much appreciate Are you ready? At your pleasure. Okay. So we forward. Uh -huh. I think you can see why we're so happy to have this as part of our part of our collection. And and there's a um, dis discussion here about about the provenance of the, of the work and so forth. Professor Bennett, would you like to offer just to talk to us a little bit about your process and your inspiration for doing this? Well, um, I, I tend to work in sort of an expressionistic. Uh, vein, rather than trying to create a life like a, like a, a Madame Tussauds wax museum where it would just be a, a, a complete reconstruction uh, of, of the way the individual looked. And so it's modeled in clay and, and I've left that process uh, in, in part and I think by leaving the su surface a little bit loose maybe it expresses a bit more life uh, than if it were just a, a mannequin uh, presentation. And also, uh, with this particular uh, pose, this is this uh, is capturing a sense, the spirit of the original piece that's at, uh, in, in Jamestown, the full-size, eight-foot-tall figure, where he's turning and he's gesturing back to the school that is placed on, a, on the campus of the school. Education is very important in this hand. This, he's holding his robe and he's gesturing back to the school. And so, in this particular uh, the idea of having him turning slightly, perhaps uh, I'd like to think, gives a sense of life uh, to the to the portrait. Uh, that sense of movement uh, is in the, in the piece as well. So there it is. <laughs> well, thank you. It is a beautiful piece, and I think it, it, it does all those things. And you know, from our standpoint, being able to educate and tell people about why he mattered and yes. why it was important, his connection to Truman, all of that is it's so much easier to do that with physical objects uh, than just a, a panel on the wall. So we're really, really grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Would you like to say a few words on behalf of the family? Or? Absolutely. Um, out of your way. Huh? The, I, I want to thank everyone involved in this, Professor Benedict, Mr. Bertman. Uh, this is a, a great honor and a, a really extraordinary and beautiful uh, replica of my grandfather. I unfortunately was never able to meet him, but I grew up steeped learning about him. And uh, I know that my mother uh, was very pleased to see this uh, original done in Jamestown. Um, it's very expressive and she really felt that it, it captured a lot of the energy that her father had. So thank you very much. This is wonderful. Thank you to the Truman Museum. I, this is a, uh, a great honor for us to have my grandfather's bust among these really significant exhibit, exhibits uh, that honor a significant president um, in our nation's history. Um, I, my personal feeling is that I, I see this as, 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 and you can see it here, as a wonderful collaboration between two really visionary, uh, ethical people who, who have the vision of these trials that had never done before, that would take the vanquished and treat them with equity uh, and use the framework of the rule of law. And it, it really is an extraordinary event in history. Um, and then, beyond that, they had the conviction uh, to make this a reality. And this was no easy thing that they both did together. Um, and so, speaking personally, um, my hope for my grandfather's legacy, for the legacy of the trials, for the legacy of the kind of collaboration I live in Washington, D.C., you don't see much of it right now, uh, is, is, is that it's a, it's a terrific history lesson, but I hope it's not left in history. I hope that we can bring this type of thought, this type of intelligence, uh, this type of collaboration to the strife in justice and equity that we, we see today. So thank you again. Great honor. Thank you. Thank you. That, uh, the 
that was very beautifully stated, you know, this idea of the collaboration between uh, two very important individuals in our government at that time, uh, how refreshing that is. And they had, you know, this, this vision of, of how, how to do it. And I, I had a quote that uh, the archive staff provided for me that, from our collection uh, that I thought was very, uh, very interesting, that Jackson uh, shared with Truman this, this, this sense of how history and justice were coming together. At the beginning of the trials, he said, uh, the record on which we judge these defendants today is the record on which history will judge us tomorrow. To pass these defendants, a poison chalice is to put to our own lips, is put it to our own lips as well. And so they understood the importance of doing this right and getting it right. And the, the video that Clay mentioned that we'll turn on here shortly, um, you'll see Harry Truman reminiscing about this, about this important collaboration. And you know, it's amazing, he had this great trust in Justice Jackson to appoint him to this. This was obviously a very significant role to play. And Truman said in this video, you'll see him say, never again will someone be able to say, I was just following orders. Never again will people be able to give those kind of orders and know that, you know, as you say, the rule of law, it is not just brute force that will overcome them, but the, but the beauty of, of liberty and, and freedom and, and law and fairness and equity and all of those things come to, come to play. So I think it's appropriate that that great American ideology and, and hopefully universal ideology is represented uh, with these two men and, and how they went about that. Iraq and Don invited us to come today. My wife, Teresa, she homeschools the children. Wonderful. And so uh, we thought this would be a great... Great history lesson. Yeah, history lesson. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're essentially a, a field trip. <laughs> That's uh, right. School. The Jackson Center, it's uh, dedicated, uh, dedicated to his legacy and to his work. We have two pieces. We have a piece that's all about Robert Jackson, and we try and cover all the things we can know, we can do and know about him. The other piece is Jackson left us with some great teachings, and we want to be able to share some of that. We want to be able to get that out to school children. We want to be able to get that out to teachers. So we have a number of programs that we do for educators, so that we can get that sense of justice out into the world today. And uh, so the Jackson Center, we have exhibits that change on a regular basis. We have some permanent exhibits, but we'd love to have you come and join us anytime. Uh, it's just uh, it's just a wonderful place to be, and uh, um, there's a lot of good programs that happen there. Um, the gentleman behind the camera, to my right, <laughs> uh, is Greg Peterson. Greg is the founder of the Jackson Center. 15 years ago, it, uh, when it came into being, uh, he had the vision to say. We had this general from Jamestown who was a solicitor general, an attorney general. Uh, he was a Supreme Court justice and then the chief prosecutor at Nuremberg that we, we need to do something with this. And so they had the vision and they, uh, a group of folks got together and, and started the center. And it has just grown from there in programming and what we do. Uh, we do everything from modern day Supreme Court cases and trying to bring the people who are there and then when we do these things, we tie them to how Jackson, how Robert Jackson would have, would have uh, seen the case. And uh, we have uh, some very expert people who, uh, who are on our board and who are friends of the Jackson Center who come and do that. And it's, it's kind of, it, it's extremely interesting when you have something that's going on today that these people can tie it to. Here's what Jackson said in his decisions 50 years, 60, 70 years ago, listen to this. And, uh, and then today we still hear in court decisions, in, this, in the recent set of court decisions, when we can have both sides in a decision cite Jackson. Impressive. So thank you for having us here today. We're, we're appreciative. Thank you, gentlemen, for making this possible. Uh, it's, it's phenomenal. Thank you. Well, we hope this is not the end of the journey in, in terms of potential collaboration between the Truman Library and the Jackson Center and, and then we know that the, uh, the Jackson Center and potentially the Truman Library. Uh, Thank you also very much for being here. It's been a great, uh, great pleasure. As I say, this is a wonderful piece and Don and Dexter, thank you so much for, for the work that was involved in this and to those of you from the Jackson Center and family to be here with us. And